we'll sing that chorus. Sing with me how great. I want you to open up your mouth inside here and sing it. He is great. Say how great. <laughs> I can't hear you. You got to open up your mouth and do that. Because our God is a great deliverer. He's a mighty healer. He's a strong tower. David said a righteous runs into him and they are safe. <laughs> is our God. Sing with me our great. <laughs> Elohim, come on, Tim, and God will sing how great, how great is our God. You know, there's an author, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. You got to get back to those old hymns. Say, how great thou art. Lift up your hands and say, how great thou art. You got to sing it. Say, then sings. That's it. That's it right there. My Savior God to thee somebody say how great thou art how great you gotta say it like you mean it today say how great say then sings my soul one more time come on then sings my savior God my savior God to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. Then sings my soul. I don't know what you may have been through but I know there are witnesses out there from 2020 all the way to 2022 that you can say your God is a healer he's a mighty 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 redeemer one more time say then sings then sings my my savior to thee Say how great, how great thou art. We bless your name, Yahweh. How great thou art. <laughs> then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art. Just stay right there. Father, we lift you up today. We exalt you because you alone are God. I bless your name, Yahweh. I worship you, Holy Spirit. We bow down before the Ruach Kakadesh. Then we say, you alone be lifted up. Let no flesh glory in your presence, Lord. It is a privilege and a pleasure to be in your house. As David said, I was glad when they say unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I, a songwriter said, I came running and Lord, we are here today. And we have come into this place. We have gathered in this place to worship you.
are happy, Lord God, for the work that you have done in our lives, Yahweh. It is you that has healed. It is you that has restored. It's you that have revived. It's you that have renewed our spirits, Yahweh. And so we bless your name. Say, bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. <laughs> and all that is within me, bless his holy name. I feel that spirit of worship in this place. And sometimes you don't understand that that's all it takes to win the battle. It's just for you to lift your voices. Ah, the mighty warriors know that you don't need to do much. God say, all I want you to do is hold your peace and just shout unto God with your voice of triumph. And he says, I'll do the rest. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about the problem you're thinking about right now. God say, if you cast all my cares, all your cares upon him. He said, I will deliver you. I will heal you. I want to be your God this day. So as we come before him, let us forget about ourselves. Concentrate on him. And worship him. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Let us get into this word. It's going to be quick, joyful. <laughs> I hope you can hear me out there in, in Zoom land and in, in social media land. I hope you're hearing me clear. Just let my uh, media team know if you're hearing us loud and clear. Send some thumbs up. Uh, say something so they can know that we can get some feedback in the house. I know we're feeling good in the house. I, I, you can hear me loud and clear. I got some very special visitors in the house. I want to really, really thank you guys for coming out. You know, I, it, it's a pleasure, Brother Mike, Sister Sam, just to see you here. Just to know that um, you have taken up your time to be here with us today to fellowship and to hang out with us as we glorify the only wise God. How it feel to be in the house, Sister Susie? I feel nice, eh? It feels good. <laughs> it's a joyous and wonderful feeling. As our young, as our teenagers and youngsters go over to their section to do their thing, we're just gonna um, just get into this word. I know that we are in the process of kind of getting the, the space ready, so we haven't done that full blast yet because we are, we, we are getting the space ready so that we have sound and cameras and everything going. So we, can, we really want to capture that uh, pure love feel that is very interactive that people can actually speak to us and we can speak back to you so that's one of the reasons that we are really uh the media team has been really a a plus a a a a plus 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 i don't know how much we can give on that but they're doing a really excellent job just making sure that we can really keep that connectivity right across um you know we're gonna do a full dedication service and a full launch uh, in the first week of, of, of February. So that's going to be really the groundbreaking. We have prayed in this house already. Evangelists went around and anointed all these doors and we prayed and we prayed and we prayed and we sanctified. And the beauty about this is that even though I don't know what the intention was for this building, but we are the first to occupy it. <laughs> Look at God. So this is a house of prayer. Somebody say house of prayer. This is what we have here. And so it's dedicated for worship. And so wherever you are, uh, you might be seeing us on social media, on Facebook, wherever you are watching right now, just know that you can come and fellowship with us. We are going to socialize our address. You can physically, if you're in the Tampa Bay area, you can come out and experience what we are experiencing here in the house. It is the Ruach Akadesh. It is nothing that is done by Pastor Wayne Studdard and our evangelist Studdard. It's nothing that is generated by us. It's simply the Lord's doing. And it's marvelous in our eyes. We are just really happy to be in the house today. We started today and the QOD kind of provoked a thought that I thought was worth us really discussing today. It is this battle that takes place in our in our hearts, in our bodies. And you know, last night I was having a conversation with my daughter and we were talking about just, and the young people, and we were talking about our bodies being this vessel because we are an earthen vessel. And the funny thing about us is that something, imagine a car. <laughs> a car is not gonna go anywhere unless there is a driver. Mm -hmm. I like to use real case analogies so you can really get it. Because we are painting a picture here and I need you to understand how your maker. Last week we spoke about your maker. And we said that your maker created you for a purpose. And a part of that purpose is that you are a humanus, 
a clay body that is an earthen vessel the bible calls you so it means that you are made to carry something mm -hmm. uh we're going something where so you are designed to carry something and you are carrying something at the moment it is just a matter of whether or not you are carrying uh the light of god or whether you are a vessel of oppression <laughs> Uh, you're, you're, you're being used by the enemy. There's a driver in your car. It's not a matter of um, is your car working. It's always working. It's just a matter of who you have given the, the driver's permit to operate your earthen vessel. And at this point, we are here to really make it known to you that God has called you and designed you as your body is a living temple. A temple, an earthen vessel that's designed for something. But there's a, a, a battle. Even when we come to a place of recognition and saying that this message that Paul is writing here is not for unsaved people. He's talking to the church, those who are saved. And he's saying that there is, as a matter of fact, he's testifying. Paul is, it's very personal. Paul is speaking to himself. He's saying there is a member that is at war within my body. That's the problem because I want to do good. <laughs> mm -hmm. You ever hear some people say, yeah, man, I'm doing all I can to really, uh, I, I'm, I'm doing all I can to make it in. But at the same time, there is this opposing force. And I can't even call the devil's name because that's not the devil. That's just me. <laughs> Somebody step on my toe and I want to tell them a piece of my mind. That's me. That's, that's Wayne Stoddard. That has nothing to do with the devil. That's just my flesh. <laughs> The Bible said that we, are, we, we sin when we are drawn away by our own lust. Let's stop. We're not talking about the devil today. We're talking about just us as a vessel and the conflict that happens within our souls, within our hearts, within our bodies. And so we want to come to a resolve. And this resolve is how can I make God become uh, the preeminent force in my life. That's the question we're asking today. How? The how? And Paul is taking it from several angles. And Evangelist, I'm going to ask you to take a microphone because I, I, I'm going to ask you to read with me today because we're going to go through a little bit of reading as we, as we really dissect this scripture together. You can sit right there. We can dissect this scripture together. We are looking, I want to really dial in from Romans 7. And we're going to look at verse 14 all the way down to, to uh, 14, from 14 to 25. Don't, don't give us any more volume. Is there any more volume? I'm getting a little bit of feedback, right? So from 14 through to the end of the chapter, which is 25. Mm -hmm. Lift that mic up, evangelist. Yes. Thank you. And so we're going to just read as we talk through what Paul is saying here as he's talking with this struggle that is going on on the inside. That's Romans 7 and verse 14 through to 25. Go ahead and read it when you find it. Uh, the NLT version is good. I like that version because it kind of opened up a little bit in the modern day language that you can uh, really get the, the substance of what Paul is trying to say. Go ahead. So the trouble is not with the law, mm -hmm. for it is spiritual and good. Mm -hmm. The trouble is with me, mm -hmm. for I am all too human, a slave to sin. Mm -hmm. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Mm -hmm. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know what, that what I'm doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So... I am not the one doing wrong. It is sin living me that does it. Yes. And I know that nothing good lives in me. That is, in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want what is wrong, but I do it anyway. Yes. But if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. I have discovered this principle of life that, th that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. Mm. This power makes me a slave to sin that is still within me. 
Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is? It is my mind I really want to obey God's law. But because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. Mm. So there is something that is going on here. And the Apostle Paul is confessing a few uh, realities that he's coming into. And we're going to talk about those realities because I really don't think we are much different from the Apostle Paul. And he, uh, a Pharisee of Pharisee, learned at the feet of Gamaliel, a, a law-keeping and a law-abiding uh, man of God. And then coming to the realization, you know what it is to be a, a student of the law and to be a, a scholar of it and to really walk out the law with excellence because he was rated among his community. So he's a man of excellence when it comes to obeying and keeping the ordinances of the law. So much so that he was very uh, self-righteous about it. That he, he decided he was going to persecute those who were not aligning themselves with what he understood the law to be based on how he was brought up. That's something by itself because there is an understanding. Uh, the question I want to start with is how can you, after being a student of the word and understanding and think that you be, you know all things about God, grew up in the church, years you have spent here, decades, and at the same time you could be in such error that the, the, the Savior and Lord of the world comes into, in, in, into your place of operation, comes into your, your midst, and you don't even recognize him so much so that you persecute those who see him. Because a lot of times the simple person see God, and because the other man who is at the top of the rank don't see God, him persecute the small man, right? <laughs> so that was what was happening. Paul was a man of authority. He was a Pharisee. He was in the Sanhedrin council. And so he is saying in his arrogance that I, I understand this thing. And who are these fishermen and unlearned people who are desecrating the name of the most high God? So a lot of times in our pride and arrogance, when we think we know, we don't know a thing. And so I'm going to say to you today, Whatever you think you know about this walk, let us get to a place in our humility that we can say, Lord, empty me of my own inhibitions and show me the truth of your word. Every time I pick up this book, I say that because we have been brought up with such, uh, you, you know, cultural uh, tampering with what God is saying. And that's the reason why we do a Wednesday night study where we say we are walking through the Bible. So now if I am a Christian and if I am going to live by this thing, I need to understand the full content of the book. I need to understand it from Genesis to Revelation to really get a full appreciation of what God intended <laughs> when he called us to this marvelous grace. So let's get back to Paul. And Paul uh, found himself in a position where he came in contact with the risen Savior. We all know the story. And Paul was struck down. The man who was supposed to be learned fell blind. Isn't that an irony? You are so enlightened. You know, that's a word that has been abused in this time and this season. This enlightenment. Everybody talk about how enlightened they are. Yeah? And they're enlightened. And at the same time, you look at them and you see them operating in a state of darkness. Because you cannot find light unless you search through the word of God. This is where the way, it's the way, the truth and the life. There's no other way to go to God but through Yeshua. Let me just make that clear before we go any further. So there we see now Paul coming into a realization of himself. But even though he has come in contact with the resurrected Christ. So now he's truly saved. He was a church goer before. I don't know about you, but I've, I've been to church long before I got saved. I was in church long before I got saved. <laughs> I was doing church. <laughs> I was hanging out in church. I was playing music and I was singing. And I was being a blessing, but I wasn't saved. I can say that about myself. Mm -hmm. Let's come. Let's deal with the reality. Now, Paul was in the Sanhedrin council, but he did not know Christ. Mm hmm. And then when, he, when Christ called out to Paul, Paul said, who are you? Imagine. You are sitting in a place of authority and Christ called you and you say, who are you, Lord? Mm, you're in trouble now. <laughs> you realize like Isaiah, when Isaiah found himself standing in the presence of God in Isaiah 6. And he realized that the train of God filled the temple. Uh, he, he cried out because he realized he was on judgment. 
when Paul heard God call him, he, he knew he was immediately in judgment seat and he was, he was, he was terrified <coughs> for his life. Mm -hmm. And God is calling because a lot of us here are in error. You're within earshot of my voice. We are in error because we think we are, we are, we are operating in the spirit of God, but it's just religion and, 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 and culture. And you haven't come into a relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And we want to speak to the relationship because that's what Paul is saying. Now I am truly saved. Now I have come in contact with the risen Savior. I need to understand how to adjust my thinking, adjust this carnal pride, this, this, this war that is happening in me because I think I'm better than people. That's the bottom line of it. Now you're coming into him pride. And he said, God is saying that you need to humble yourself. And he's saying, I have a problem with that because I'm learned. I'm from the Ivy League school. I can't, I can't mingle with commoners and squab, squab people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so therefore, a lot of us think that because of we are from the upper echelon of society and the education that we have and the people that we have moved amongst and the people we are associated with has given us some sense of higher hierarchy in the rank of God's hierarchy, but it doesn't work that way. God called Paul again and sent him to a humble little man and said, go learn how to be humble because I had to send Moses from the palace to the backside of the desert to learn to be humble, to lead sheep that you can lead my people. You have to learn how to be humble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wish you could get this, what God is doing. So God set him up. <laughs> set him up after years of experiencing this great honor of being this esteemed leader uh, god set him up and put him down and said god paul don't worry about your mistakes because you're gonna bear a burden for this cross you're going you're going i'm, I'm gonna work you <laughs> i'm gonna work you for the gifting that you have within you mm -hmm. so to whom much is given much is required so let's talk about i'm just giving you the backdrop so you can understand this situation that Paul is in. This is not an unlearned. This is not a man who doesn't know the word. This is not somebody who have not experienced relationship and understand theology and understand the dynamics and the philosophy of Christ and the very dynamics of the Torah. He is learned. Hmm. I wish somebody could get this. This is safe people talk. Shut the door. It's close. It's family talk because this is something we are, we now have to think about it when we are standing and God confronts us like he confronts Moses in the burning bush. I say, I have a mission for you. Uh, you start thinking to yourself now because you say, I'm conflicted because I don't want to go back to Egypt. The last time I did something for those people who are supposed to be my people, they asked me, who are you and who make you Lord of us? So you diss me. My own people diss me so therefore I don't want to hear from you no more. And God is saying, I got a mission for you and sending you back to the very people that offended and hurt you. Woo. Uh, I don't know how we can dig. So therefore now there's a battle going on in Moses. There's a battle going on in Paul because now he has to, he has to submit to the word. He's conflicted. He knows he's the God of Isaac, a, a, Abraham and, and Jacob and he's conflicted. Because it's not about who is speaking, it's about what I can accept for myself. <laughs> mm -hmm. But sometimes, not every time when God speaks, it is that easy for us to walk into it. <laughs> it requires us to go in some time of fasting and stripping away. So Paul say for, we know that the law is spiritual. So he's acknowledging something in 14. I am of the flesh, <laughs> sold into slavery on the sin. And he speaks of the old nature. When he says, I am of the flesh, he's speaking to the old nature. He's saying that I am man first before I meet God. So I have been, you hear me? Confessing. Pastor, we confess first that I was in church longer than I have been a Christian. <laughs> so I've been in church bad broke as they would say you have been you have been broken into a culture of churchism but you have not met the resurrected christ mm -hmm. so you know how to shake and you know how to walk and you know how to do all the posture bless the nile favor them blah 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 you have to how you're doing blah, 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 blah. and you just give off scripture and you say oh my gosh she's saved hallelujah uh, she know the shake <laughs> but she has not come in contact with the resurrected savior mm. 
This word is good. I want, I want you to get this. So as a believer, it's not enough to know and come in contact with Christ. You have got to resolve the battle that's within. Huh. Joyce Myers wrote a book, The Battlefield of the Mind. It's very, very important that our thought life be taken captive to the word. When the word of God says taking every thought captive, it's not just figuratively speaking it's a literal thing evangelist it's very literal it's calling you to say as i think this thing i'm gonna weigh it against the word of god and if it doesn't measure up i'm not gonna let it sit so it's not it's not the sin is not in the thought you know because the thought is how you get tempted and temptation is not a sin so let's clarify that you can have a bad thought come to you but if it doesn't influence your action then it becomes just a temptation because you were tempted to just not say good morning. But by the time you got to them, you said good morning. So you conquered that temptation because you say Christ say you must live good with all men and be at peace with all men if it is possible. So you do your part because the word took precedence over your feeling. Mm, let's get to that feeling thing because that's a problem in Christendom. We have so much people who, if you ask them questions, I'm from, as you know, we are from Caribbean background and Jamaicans love to say, boy, my spirit not take that one day. What does that mean? Your spirit? What spirit is that that is up? All right, so we talk about the driver's seat. Now we can roll back a little bit. Because you are now owning a spirit that is not a spirit of love. And you have now spoken something unto yourself. And you say, my spirit, you own something that is not about brotherly love. According to what Peter was teaching us in 2 Peter 2. 2 Peter 1, when he talk about brotherly love. And he gives us the step towards Peter. Peter, understand what it is to think you arrive, you know. And realize uh, talk is cheap. Peter run up in mouth early and said, God, I will, run, I will be with you to the head. No guy <laughs> can't take me from your side. And a little damsel said, yo, you was with him. And he said, oh, me? Bleep, 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 not me. <laughs> he started swearing. <laughs> Thought he was a bad man, right? Until when he ran into, he ran into uh, uh, the Roman army and, and saw what they were doing to his Lord and his Savior. And he caught in his fear. Fear caused him to deny Christ. So let's come back to this. <laughs> so we see in the prospect of things as we are looking at Paul here, Paul is coming and acknowledging some things about himself. We see him use in verse 14, he used, I am, I am of the flesh, sold into slavery under sin. So he's going back to the very garden of Eden, the roots of what caused him to be here mm. and so he's at this place now where he's looking at himself and say but the very construct of how we were because of the fallen race when men fall when man fall madam and man and woman adam and eve they fell we became we inherit this thing where we have this sin nature mm -hmm. and so when you are when they have a child, <laughs> very funny thing. You will have to teach the child to be kind, but you don't have to teach him to be selfish. <laughs> He's born with that. <laughs> he will say, mine. And if you take it, he cry. Because that's, the psychologists teach you that a child is born as a bundle of id. And when they talk about id, it's about selfishness. Id is the very basic instinct that exists in you for survival. But it's a necessary thing because God put it in a child. And if the child is even abandoned in the wild, everything it finds, it puts in its mouth because it's about survival. And so it just eats until it finds something worse. It might eat something bad, but its it body acclaimed to it. It's trying to survive. So it's about selfish survival, basic instinct. So you're born as a bundle of survival aid, and you are all about yourself. A child don't care about what the mom is feeling and their emotion. They can only deal with, I'm hungry. <laughs> Cry. It's about the child. That's where you start. So the very core of our nature is selfishness. But when it comes to learning good things, you have to say, 
uh, share and you have to keep on reinforcing it and don't use that word. Uh, you wonder sometimes one one gangster, one outcast uncle come in and curse a bad word once and baby pick it up. Bleep, bleep, bleep. And you're like, but you've been hearing Jesus all day. Why you ain't saying Jesus? <laughs> Because our nature gravitates to some things that uh, seem like they are of the dark nature because we are, we are originally in the state where we have fallen. And so that's the reason why, let me just make this clear, we all need a savior. For by grace are we saved, not of works that any man can boast. So your righteousness can't save you. That, let's just clear that out of the way. So Paul is in a dilemma because he said, no matter how much I was living by the law, I'm still filthy. What's going on? My mind is still wrong. My heart is still imagining vain things. How do I deal this thing? He said, oh, wretched man I am. What is going on within me? I don't know how to control this, 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 this unbridled uh, sin nature that is in my life. And so he starts dissecting this thing and he goes through and he says, you know what? I'm struggling. And he says, if I, being a Christian, try to struggle with sin in my own strength, I am slipping into the grasp of sin power. In other words, when you feel to yourself that you are able to do this in your own strength, you are just setting yourself up to fail. You ever see people yet say that, oh yeah, I'm strong enough to do this. Sometimes when I hear my children talk and say, I'll never do this. I'm like, oh, I laugh, you know, I say, it's okay. You have a whole life ahead of you. You'll never know what you'll never do until when you're put in the right or wrong situation. So, you know, we know that it's by the grace of God. No matter how much we plan our lives and purpose in ourselves. Do you know the oxymoron of life that is very funny? You can grow up in a house of abuse and you will say to yourself that you will never abuse someone. And then you see that abused person turn around and abuse someone else. <laughs> and you're like, but how do you continue that pattern? You would have thought that people would have, would have seen that and say, you know what, I'm going to move away from it. But you see somebody, it's like a trend and it continues. Because in your own strength, no matter how much you deprecate an action, you cannot will yourself away from evil. It has to be a greater and it's a higher power that we're talking about. It's not just a higher power thinking, new age, mambo jumbo. That's not what we're talking about. It has to be the power of the resurrected Christ. Because the word of God said, this same spirit that rose Jesus Christ from the dead will quicken your mortal body. That's the answer. Paul is now realizing that in my flesh, my best determination is not good enough. I cannot say to myself, I'm going to quit this thing in my own strength. It's not. Let me just avoid your frustration. You are not able to live righteous in your own willpower. But if you allow yourself as an earthen vessel to say, Spirit of the living God, I'm going to give you permission to drive. You want me to give you the description for that in Bible terms? What that means is what the Apostle Paul come back and say. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. So he's saying, I'm in the car. But I'm, I'm not driving. <laughs> I'm an observer of what the word is doing as it transforms me. Mm -hmm. So he's saying I'm in the car, but I'm a passenger because the driver is the spirit of the living God. Because if I had my way, I would have done it differently. But the spirit of God, he says, I am crucified. So he's a dead man in the car. So he says, when you are dead. Because you're crucified. You have been nailed to the cross. Your will doesn't matter. That is why Christ said, nevertheless, Christ told God, he says, "My, if it was up to me, God, if it is possible, let it pass. But he says, nevertheless, this my life and my being here is not about my will. So we have to get to a place where we become so selfless about how we feel and our feeling don't matter no more. I'm not in this thing because of feeling. If I was going to live my life with my wife and my marriage depended on feeling, I would have probably walked out a hundred times. She would have left me 10 million times. Because feelings come and feelings go. We have a commitment 
<laughs> I said to myself that because I have I have bridle, I have what is it, bridle, you know, gird up my loins and said to myself, I am going to get through this. So the commitment now caused me to stand flat-footed and say, I have made up my mind that I'm going to stand for God. It doesn't matter how you feel. So here is the thing now, bravery and fear. Let's talk about those two things. A lot of people say, boy, I don't know how I would respond if they start coming around and say, uh, if you are, if you believe in Jesus Christ, if you believe in Yeshua Mashiach, we are going to kill you. <laughs> It becomes a terrifying thing now because now we have to deal with this reality of our fear that it's a natural thing that in the human, even if a person is, they say people might jump off a building, but in flight, they, they have a change. You can see the position of how they turn themselves because it's not natural to this, for the body to want to destroy itself. It will seek to survive because God created us with survival instinct. So even that's why they can tell if somebody was pushed or if somebody was, was murdered or drowned or if they actually die because the position of how you in the, in, in the state of fighting for your life, even if you did it in, intentionally from the start, your body responds, say, I want to live because your body is in an automatic survival mode. So I'm saying that to you that when you are conflicted now with the fear of People threatening that we are going to ostracize you because you don't share our philosophy and you are not uh, uh, tolerant to the things of this world and God has not called us to tolerance. Let me just preach it like all the words say. The Bible is not about tolerance in the sense of when it comes to righteousness. He says that, listen, yes, he says, come out from among them. He says, you are in the world, but you are not of the world. You are supposed to be light. You are supposed to transform the environment that you go into. So therefore, God says, I'm not telling you that you're supposed to malice and separate from people. But I'm saying that there must be clear distinction. <laughs> when a person walk up and see Joseph, they know that Joseph is a Hebrew. <laughs> In the midst of Egypt, he was identifiable. Daniel in Babylon was identifiable because everybody knows that he's a righteous man. And up to the king say, this entire village gonna, this entire kingdom is gonna bow to Daniel's God because it's obvious Daniel doesn't do what we do, even though he's he's an excellent worker and a great councilman. So let me get back to it. So now in the thing we are we are being brought and put on trial for our faith, for what we believe in, because it's coming. It's already started. Where if you say, it's weird that. Any other religion can say, because of my faith, I don't do this. <laughs> but when Christians say it, it becomes offensive. <laughs> it's okay. I'm going to say it like I feel it. I don't care who is going to be. I'm going to speak because I'm a Christian. I got to speak what we are facing. If any other religion says something about an, a, a topic and they say that we are this way. And so we preach monogamy because this is how we live. And we smoke weed because this is what we believe as in our religion. Nobody's going to push back at them and say, uh, we have a problem with that. But when we say that we believe in the ten royal laws of God, that adultery is a sin, that this is a sin, and this is our religious rights now. <laughs> we have been challenged. Why? Because we have the truth. And when you start speaking truth, it's going to do something to lies. So there's a conflict because the truth will set men free so we are a threat to the lie and so when you are a threat to the lie they have to put you out because now you are now threatening that agenda so we are people of powerful purpose and so we are targeted let me get back to the fear so in the midst of this now we are possibly being put in a situation where they might challenge you because of your faith and it is rightfully so that your body as we just spoke about your bodily reaction might be that i'm terrified <laughs> but my mind know that i love god so i'm gonna die for this <laughs> that is where we got to get to with our christianity because that's what it was for the early church we saw them before the ruach Kadesh came on the day of pentecost <laughs> and when the conflict came flesh win 
when they were in the garden with Christ, <laughs> when the Roman soldier came upon them, flesh won. They decided, we're going to protect our bodies. <laughs> Everybody took off. <laughs> the Bible said one of the young men ran out of his clothes and wondered what he was running in, probably naked as a dead born, took off. <laughs> ran out of his clothes because he didn't want to get caught because his flesh was dominating at that time. So let's talk about this. It's about where, what are you feeding? Yeah. So at that time, they did not yet receive the power. That's the operative thing. Because when you get the power, it is not just that the Holy Spirit is in the car. Before, you, when you get saved, this is what happened. Let me create the, the, um, the analogy of this so you can see it in a very you know, lecturing term. When you get saved, you allow the Holy Spirit to come in your car. That's you being saved. So the Spirit of God is in you. But being saved is not enough. That's what Paul is saying here. There is another level that has to be attained to for you to win with this battle. Because not because you're saved now, that means that the flesh might say, okay, you win. Nope. <laughs> it's like, I'm still here. I've been dominating this place for longer. I'm the boss. <laughs> so now the Holy Spirit is in the car and you have got to do something to give him control of the steering wheel. Because the old man is driving still. And that's the process that Paul is talking about. He's saying, I am still a slave to this thing. I'm in the, I'm in the car, but my, this other part of me is still driving my life. And I need to come to a place where I can build up myself in the most holy faith that I can become empowered by the dunamis power, not a power that I can attain in my own intellect, because that's not enough. I was killing God people in my wisdom. My own intellect cannot do this. Paul was smart, brilliant. Ivy League graduate, but it was not able to sustain him to recognize Christ and to do God's will until he came to a place where now he says that, you know what? I submit to this, went in the backside of the desert. Again, sit with a little man, what was his name? Ananias, he, he sat with him and learned at his feet and he got back his sight as he learned from God. It is, isn't it funny? You think you're wise and then God blind you to give you real sight <laughs> and then when he came to himself and learn and humble himself people don't even understand this if you go read other jewish um uh, other other uh, i think josephus and other books and writings of um jewish writings you will see that they say that paul spent a, a good while out there learning and spending time that's how christ started he was in fasting and prayer and seeking god for what what do you think he was doing there when you do fasting and prayer, what are you doing? You are killing the old man. <laughs> so it's uh, give, pastor start giving out nuggets now. So this is how you get to that place where you have to. The two forces want to dominate in this vessel. And so for you to, to get to a place where you can have the right force in control, the right power, not flesh dominating, you have got to start doing some things that are feeding the spirit and not the flesh. And if you want the spirit and the flesh food, you can go to Galatians 5. <laughs> and he will tell you about the works of the flesh and the works of the spirit. Because the spirit now means that even though I feel this way, and this is how when Paul says it again, you know, Paul is going to tell you as you even as you're going to it, you're going to see him get more detail after he go through this confusion of the conflict. He's going to start off by saying there is therefore now, because he's going to come to a conclusion. It's hard for people to start reading chapter eight without reading the end of seven, because seven tells you about what he's speaking about when he said there is therefore now. No, no condemnation to those who have learned. To put their flesh under subjection. <laughs> so he's saying he's building up an argument, but because in our secular world here they give us numbers, we tend to start reading from one number. No, understand? You have to go back and see what the, he can't just start a composition by saying there's therefore no condemnation. What is he talking about? <laughs> he's talking about this conflict that's happening, and he says now if you allow the spirit of God to dominate, mm -hmm, now you are now saying that you are walking 
All right, so let's talk about this walking. Can we talking about the answers? So first of all, there are some spiritual things that you need to put into your life because two things, two members are at war. Let me bring it down to basics. Two members are at war in your body. You will, whichever one you feed more is the one that will dominate. The problem is that a lot of us have our spirits in a dwarf state because we do not do enough to feed our spirit. So we look at our spiritual life and we are malnourished. I wish you could get this word in your spirit. I feel heaven rattle when I speak that. It's a skinny, we are malnourished, anorexic spirit. And then when we look at the flesh, it's a monster, it's a Goliath. So when you're walking, you're just so carnal. Everything is about you. Selfish, I can't tell you. Hi, 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 hi. You're just full of arrogance and, and you are into a state that is this. It, it doesn't, it doesn't become it. It's not becoming for the spirit of God. So you don't know to entertain the spirit of God and angels because he said that you must be kind to all men that you may entertain angels, says God. Because there's an action that will allow the spirit of God to dwell. <laughs> I wish you could get this. Mm. Exactly. That's it. So, so, because we are spending so much time doing the self glory in things, Facebook, see me as I floss. Never seen a person wake up in the morning and put on them, you know, when before they put on all the fancy makeup and all of that and just show, this is me, really. Nope. <laughs> When you see it, it's full makeup and filter and puppy dog nose <laughs> and rabbit ears. So it's all there's it's perfection beyond perfection and beyond infinity. And that's what we show to the world because we want to show this this facade of perfection. It's how we are. And we are very good at masking the things that we consider uh, not comely. Mm -hmm. So we are in this business and this age and this culture that we're living has brought us to a place of fostering a facade and falsehood and hypocrisy. Because while we are doing that, we are depressed and we are lonely. And we are suffering with low self-esteem and we have all these things that are happening and that is real but we are just if we can just get a moment of showing the world this side of me that they may envy me not knowing my reality so we live a lie and god is not in the lie business he says they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So when the world start massaging you and, and rehearsing you into this lie lifestyle, you no longer, you have, you have automatically become disconnected from the truth of God's word because you don't look at yourself in the mirror. Paul said that, I'll tell you what Paul says about this. He says a man who reads the word of God and walk away from it and do, go back to his same ludicrous action and don't conform to the word is like a man who see himself as a mirror and forgot what he looked like. So Paul is saying, the word, here, here is something that we do when we read fast. We read so fast that we make the subject of this that you forget what you look like. No, the subject of this is that when you read the word, you see yourself. Missed you? Because Paul said, let me go back slowly again. Paul said, when you, you read this word and you walk away and forgot the word and don't let it change and transform your life, you are like a man who look into a mirror, see himself, and forgot what he looks like. All right, let's slow it down. When you read the word, what he's saying, the key is not that you forget what you look like. The key is that when you read the word, you see yourself. It's a mirror for you to look at you. And when you look at you, you're not in any filter. <laughs> You're not, you don't have no Facebook, no, no Instagram filter. You are looking at you because the word tell me, Timothy, that it is, it is sharp, cut into joints and marrow. And it tell me that it's for reproof. 
You understand? It's for building up. It's for you to get some spiritual muscles, some guns that you can stand in the day of adversity because the day of adversity is coming. And so if you are malnourished, say it again, evangelist, if you are malnourished, you will dead in the storm. Because you can't send hungry, malnourished, pia, pia, fenke, fenke soldier into war. They will die. The blow and they will follow. He's weak. And our spirits are malnourished and dwarfed. God is saying, I'm calling you to a place where you can start feeding your spirit some spiritual food. Mm -hmm. And so how is what we're talking about? And we say Galatians kind of give that. So Paul says that I am in a dilemma because you know what? Uh, I want to do this good thing, but my flesh keeps going up. How do I deal with this pastor? And he raises some points and Paul gave three lessons he learned in trying to deal with his old sinful desires. And he's giving you some nuggets and write them down. One, knowledge is not the answer. Seven and nine, he said that. Read it. <laughs> knowledge, having head knowledge of God is not the answer. Because knowledge don't really derail you. <laughs> you think the knowing was the problem? How much of you know the scripture? I we still broke it. <laughs> knowing is not the problem. So Paul is speaking to that. I know what I ought to be doing. <laughs> Anytime I catch my children doing anything, it's not like they don't know. But we have decided that we are going to rebel against what we know. Because we want to do what the flesh wants to do. It's a problem. So he says... Knowledge is not enough. That's number one. Number two, Paul felt fine as long as he did not understood the demands of the law. He's saying that when I didn't know the word, I was cool because I was doing all this thing and I was liberated from it. But when you get to know the knowledge of the word now, when he learned the truth, he knew he was doomed because now the same truth that free you also bring you to a place of judgment. Because it's two things. Judge a man in conscience and the word. <laughs> and so the same word, you ever hear this say the same sun that hardened the clay, it melt the wax. <laughs> the same word that will condemn you will give you life. <laughs> the same word that brings truth will also bring judgment. <laughs> So you have got to decide which side of the sword you're going to be on because it cuts going out and it cuts coming in. <laughs> it's the word. But it will never return void because it will affect something in your life. It's either if you receive it, it becomes a blessing. If you reject it, it becomes a curse. <laughs> mm? Yes, you know what I tell them? God said to build an ark and they hear the word. They chose. It became a curse to them to their doom. Because they did not decide to look in the mirror, see themselves, and conform to the image that God is showing them. All right, so Paul is acknowledging that head knowledge is not enough. That's number one. Then he says, self determination does not succeed if you look at 715. So we say 79 tells you that knowledge is not enough, and 7 and, and, and verse 15 tells you that I'm uh, struggling in my own strength. So self-determination is not enough. Knowledge is not enough. Self-determination is not enough. <laughs> Paul is telling you some observation that he has made about his own life. I think we can learn from this. Number three, becoming a Christian does not stamp out all sin and temptation out of one's life. Mm hmm so when Christ was tempted, was he unsaved? <laughs> no, he, was a, he was saved. He was on his mission. He was about, he was just, as a matter of fact, he was just full of the Holy Spirit. Read it in chapter 4 of Matthew. He says that John baptized Yeshua. And he came up out of the water. And the Spirit, just as what happened in the day of Pentecost. But it didn't take the form of fire. It took the form of a dove. And it says that the dove rested on him. So he was full of the spirit and God spoke and said, this is my beloved son. So right after that, he was tempted. So your being a Christian does not negate you from temptation. 
So that's one thing you got. You thinking to yourself, like, oh, it's an automatic. As soon as I get saved, I'm good. I'm just going to walk over the devil. And I'm stand up in my neck, under my feet. He say, oh, until you leave church. <laughs> I'm waiting in the car. <laughs> we got business. <laughs> right at the door, right? You say, not in the car, he's at the door. <laughs> You understand? So he's, he's just like, yeah, 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 yeah. You get your get, get it out of your system. But you know, it's going to take more than you're talking and about, more than you just praying about it. You're going to have to resist, come to a place of acknowledgement. We're going to get to that. So let me just speak to this. Uh, let me see my, okay. So I'm, I'm right at the border of my time. So let's do this. So now we are at number three and he says, becoming like Christ. And he's, he emphasizes that between verse 22 and 25. You can really highlight those and do those in your devotion this week. I will employ you to do that. Being born again takes a moment of faith, but becoming like Christ is a lifelong process. So that is the reason why as Paul enters into chapter 2, he says into chapter 8, and he finished this off and he said, okay, this whole thing of me thinking that I can do righteousness is folly. Because I can't do nothing. Then he come to a realization and he start off 8 and he said, there is therefore now, now that we acknowledge that we can do this in our own strength. So there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in. All right, you see this trick now? This is the power. <laughs> when you are in Christ Jesus, meaning that you have now allowed the quickening spirit, the same spirit that rose Yeshua from the dead to now come in and take the driver's seat. The other little one have to chill because they now get no food. All right, so here is the thing now. The, the flesh that is dominating so much in your life is because you have been feeding it more than you've been feeding your spirit. And so it is the loudest voice in your head. That's the message. When you start, I heard just, uh, Joyce Meyer said this. The easiest way to kill any form of sin habit is by starvation. Mm. Uh, when last you starve your flesh. <laughs> Don't give it what it wants. Let it kick and scream. Starve it. Cut it off. That's what Christ meant when he says that if your right hand offend you, cut it off. He's saying, stop giving it oxygen. Stop feeding it. Stop calling the number. Stop talking to it. Stop giving it what it wants. Cut it off. Cut off the air supply. Let it die of starvation because you are entertaining that thing and you are feeding your flesh and your flesh is now terrorizing you and leading you to a path of destruction. So God say, cut it off. And he's now telling you, there's therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the what? The flesh. <laughs> but walk after the spirit. <laughs> you see, there's therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Uh, for the law of the spirit of life in Jesus had set me free from the law of sin and death. So let's talk about that because a lot of people say, okay, so because Christ is in me, I'm free from doing righteousness. No, that's not what the scripture is saying. What it is saying is that because I choose the life of Christ, the life of Christ empowers me to really do the things that I couldn't do in my own strength, like what Paul was trying to do. Paul could not be saved in his own strength. Guy was killing Christians and saying he was saved <laughs> because he was operating in the law and the law only, and there was not any power and love of Christ in him. So it's now saying that when the, when, when the spirit, the, the, the law of spirit, of the spirit in uh, 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 of, of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. That part of it, the atonement law, where when your sin caught in the very act of adultery, you die, they stone you. He's saying that because of the grace of this atonement that Christ has done by paying for my, my sins, I am now find myself guilty, but I don't have to die because God has given me this life that now I can find eternal and everlasting life in him once I confess my sin. He's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me. And so that Paul found to be the answer. The only way I can do this thing is if I kill this spirit, kill this flesh, and walk in the spirit. Let's talk about walking in the spirit and I close this thing. 
What does it mean? So Paul talked about the whole armor in Ephesians. And he says that the old armor, he says the helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, truth around your loins, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. He said the sword of the, the sword of the spirit <laughs> and the shield of faith. So here is it. The spirit, walk in the spirit. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, says Ephesians. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That is what he's saying. Walk in the spirit. Walk in the word. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God, and him alone shall thou serve. Don't commit adultery. Don't covet your neighbor. Because if you go and drop out one, you go and say, it's okay if you covet your neighbor too. And covet him wife and covet him property. So when you start drop out, you know, you're in a problem. Because <laughs> you start deciding that you're filtering. Did God really say that? Who said that? The, the serpent in the garden to Eve. <laughs> yes, God did. He did say it. <laughs> so what it is, walking in the spirit is simply choosing that today. Somebody offend me, but I said that, you know what? In as much as it is possible, I'm walking in the word. So now I say, somebody threatened my life with this and that i say god has not given me a spirit of fear i'm walking in the world but of love and of power and of a sound mind somebody said to you you know you can't do this thing you say well i can do all things through christ who gives me strength and you are walking in the spirit and you are saying that my life despite i feel this god says that i should do this and i will walk out his word christ said at the end of his journey he says everything that is written written about me in the book and in the law of the prophets i have fulfilled what christ did was walk in the spirit the word of god says in matthew 4 he was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil he was led by the spirit he was walking in the spirit god spoke and all he did to walk in the spirit is to walk in obedience to what god has spoken and if god says it i don't want no confrontation i don't want no debate i don't want no argument it is written says god and that's all we need to have our resolve if it is written there, I don't care what society says. I don't care what the government says. I don't care what anybody says. It is written. Peter said it. He said, listen, they beat them and they put them in prison. And they say, let the man them out and say, listen, go and stop preaching this Yeshua. He says, what? You beat me and that's okay. You can beat as much as you want, but you can't tell me not to preach Christ. Because <laughs> that's my duty. I have to preach Christ because that's a gospel. And he says, listen, I would rather to obey. And he said, why don't you obey us? We are, the, we are your seniors. We are the Sanhedrin council. He says, well, I would rather. I respect your office, Mr. Government. I respect your office, Mr. Bishop. But I would rather be a God than man, <laughs> says Peter. And he says, we have to because we are called. Yes, the Bible says we should obey authority, but not when it conflict. He said to children, obey your parents in the Lord. It is about an operation, whether the authority is going to speak in accordance to God's law, then we are cool. But if you're going to talk against God, I choose God. I choose God. Whose side are you on, said Moses? He says, those who are with God stand with me. I'm standing with God. And so at this point, when the battle comes, when the conflict comes, and when flesh rises up, we walk in the spirit. And remember that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, Yeshua, has set you free from the law of sin and death because he died for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life because he died that you might not have to come on the death through the law of sin and death. That's why they were going to stone the woman found in the very act because his law of sin and death that is gone. And then Paul goes further and he says that when people start hearing him preach about this law of sin and death and the law of life in Christ Jesus. And they start wondering, ah, is that a different law? Is that something? Is that something? He says, listen, 
uh, does, the, does this give me an authority? If you read further up in 7 and 8, he's going to say, do, do you think that this liberty that I speak about in Christ give me authority to sin and, and to break the law? He says, God forbid, because the word of God is good. He started out by saying, we know that the law is spiritual and that I am flesh. And he says, you know that the, the law reveals sin in me. So the law did its work, but now I am in a dilemma. And now I need something more than just a law that, that is going to put me in a situation where I'm going to fail. Because I can't do this by myself. I need a savior. And that's when he says, I'm going to endow you with power. Mm -hmm. And this power will give you the authority to do this thing. And so that's how we walk with this power. Because we have received the fire from an eye. Close your eyes. Let us pray. Father, we lift you up. We magnify your name, God. You are holy. You alone are holy. You alone are magnificent. It is by your grace that we are saved. Not of works that any man should boast. And so we come before you today and we say, Lord, forgive us of our sins. And cleanse us from all iniquity. Purge us, O oh God. Lord, we purpose in our hearts that we will shut down the unfruitful works of darkness. That we will shut down this carnality, this pride, this flesh. Lord, as Galatians 5 speak to it, Lord God. The fruits of the flesh, Lord God. Which is reveling and, and lawlessness and everything that goes against the word of God. We now denounce those things in our lives. And we say, Lord, we invoke the Holy Spirit. Ruach HaKadosh, come now. And fill our hearts, empower us to walk out this law of life in Christ Jesus. That we may experience this great liberty this day. As we yield in our bodies and soul. In the name of Yeshua, our Mashiach. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come evangelists, let's bring this to a, bring the curtains down here. Um. I know you're out there and you're watching. We're getting ready here to really do something special in the city. And as I often say, God call us to be and give us this great commission. The great commission is to start in Jerusalem. You have to start in your community. So we start in Tampa Bay where we are. And then we are spiraling out. I know we have people from Canada, from Africa, from all over that's watching. But we are saying that we still have to be in the house because we are called to fulfill this great commission, which is to serve the people in our community and to keep on being a blessing to you. If you have heard something here today that has moved your heart, I pray that you may just uh, let us know. Send us a message. Go to our website, pureloveministries.org. And you just leave us a message there and let us know where you are and how we can keep this connectivity. And we know that God is doing something special. So you just tell us so we can keep that connection and pray with you in whatever area you need prayer. I'm going to ask evangelists just to pray uh, that prayer for those who are out there who may need deliverance, who may need healing, who may need restoration, and who may need to be saved. Just call on him. Go ahead, evangelist. Amen. You know, the message has gone for it. And if you're someone who says, you know what? I, I want to walk in the spirit. I want to follow the Lord. But how do I do it? You have that opportunity right now to surrender your life to the Lord God Almighty. How you do that is to invite Yeshua Mashiach, Jesus Christ, into your life. You do your personal prayer. You know your sins. You know, I, I can lead you, but you know ultimately what you need to do. Go ahead and confess your sins to the Lord. Say, you know what, Lord? I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I fall short. And then say, God, I repent. Meaning that, Lord, I'm committed with your help not to go back to doing the things that I was doing. And then ultimately, you with your mouth have to accept him, Yeshua Mashiach, Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior. The word of God says, if you confess with your mouth and believe with your heart that God has raised Jesus Christ, Yeshua from the dead, you will be saved. So go ahead and repent of your sins. Go ahead and invite it in, into your heart. 
And I also pray that as you invite Yeshua Amashiach, Jesus Christ, into your heart, that indeed you'll invite the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKadosh, into your life as well. Invite him to fill you. Invite him to use you. Invite him to help you to govern that fleshly appetite. If you are a believer, I invite you wherever you are, excuse me, to raise your hand and just submit yourself fully to God. We come in agreement for your healing. We come in agreement for your deliverance, for your restoration. We come in agreement for a renewed mind. We come in agreement for the strength through the Holy Spirit to walk in that empowerment that Pastor Wayne preached about. We come in agreement for your provision. We come in agreement that the Lord God Almighty will meet every need that you may have and that you may walk victoriously in him. In the name of Yeshua Mashiach, amen. Let me sing this one time with us as we get ready to lay this place. I am the Lord. Come on, this the next. That he let thee. Say, I am the Lord. sent my word to heal your disease. I am the Lord, your healer. Hallelujah. I am the Lord that healed thee. I am the Lord, your my word to heal your disease. I am the Lord, your healer. Hallelujah. We don't know what may be going on in your life, but just know that God is a healer. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly about what we could ever ask or think. And so today, whatever you're going through, just receive this word and let the spirit of the living God, the Ruach HaKadosh, continue to permeate your hearts, your mind, and your soul. Do what Christ says, cut it off. It is better to enter into heaven with one hand than to go in as a old man and burn in hellfire, than to have your whole body, your whole body and burn in hellfire. So give your heart Submit to the leading of God's word. Have yourself a wonderful day. Now may the saving grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the full fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, now rest, remain, and abide with us all until Yeshua comes. Amen. God bless you all. Thanks. Thanks.